Welcome back to another edition of Faith Talks. It's been such a good journey. Um, I think this is episode, I don't even know what episode number we're up to, but this just this last year, I think this is episode number seven. I've been busy recording, catching up with a um, whole bunch of different pastors and leaders and people from not just in Australia, but around the globe. And we are excited to today have a great man of God, great man of faith um, with us today. He's going to be um, giving us some input. We're going to talk about all things life, faith, ministry, family, and even grilling. That's right, grilling tips today on Faith Talks. Uh, can you please welcome our state president for ACC Victoria, Pastor Matt Hines. 
Hello, hello, hello. Good to see yeah. you. <laughs> it's so good to have you on here, Pastor Matt. It's been Thank great um, over the last couple of months. We've just been able to get to know you a little bit by, you know, text and call. And, um, you know, we got to meet um, and, and catch up a little bit back in May, which seems like an eternity ago. Um, last, last decade. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, it, it just seems like that you know those moments. You, you look back and you go, "Gee, that was that was May that we last actually saw each other physically in in person." You know, we we um, were at national conference and we came down to uh, Faith Church that weekend after that. But that was like what? What's May now? Four months ago? Three months ago? It's just a blur. I think these days just blur into something where. I think I was saying to my wife the other day, I go, what day is it? I don't even know what day it is anymore. <laughs> no. And, yeah, I, I was exactly the same. as It was um, Saturday the other day and I'm like going, oh, yeah, this is this is pretty cool. And then um, I realised a couple of hours later it was actually Monday. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> it, that's, oh, that's, so that's a real key. It's a, it's a real problem, isn't it? Because um, it seems to have, now that there's no sort of um, – in, in lockdowns, you're not going off to a workplace per, per se. A lot of people lose the routine that they normally would have and you're getting up later or you're thinking, oh, I don't have to travel, so I'll just stay in, I'll just have to stay in my pyjamas all day. Um, people have lost that sort of sense of rhythm and routine in, in their days. And how are you finding that's in, impacting people, in, the people that you pastor in Faith Church? I, it, it is a challenge. You, you, you just can't get around it. You know, I mean, I find it challenging. Uh, yep. I'm a man of routine, get up in the morning. I mean, I still have my routine, but my exercise routine has been out the window. And so we would go for walks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've never been a great walker. I'd rather just do, you know, high intensity training than get out of there. So that's been a challenge. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, I think for our congregation, uh, I think one of the things that has been a challenge for, for people of faith is that, you know, the whole world can go crazy, but you know that you can get to church on a Sunday. So yep. that consistency, when I mean, you think about it, the church has been the most consistent thing probably in the world in the last, you know, or since I've been around, last 30, 40 years. So to actually have that consistency interrupted, I think yep. that has just been the challenge. And so, uh, you know, like you, we've just been connecting with our people. We've been doing devotions in the morning. We've been doing a few prayer meetings. Just a way to let them know, hey, listen, we're here. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. Yeah. Um, whatever you need from us, we're there, and we just really want to let you know. Out of all of the information that's out there, you know, let's take some time out and look at the Word of God and just spend a bit of time together. So yeah, it's it's really important. People need to feel like they're a part of uh, community um, yeah. and connected, even though they're sort of disconnected. Uh, and now Melbourne's had it a little bit rougher than us here in the in the regions, but now we're all in this together. Again, yes, uh, again, that's right. Yeah, I, I'm blaming Shepparton um, completely. No, I'm not. You guys in Shepparton, you got. Uh, <laughs> we're praying for you too. Um, but it's it's one of those things where it, it, it kind of feels a little bit like we've been um, the the school teacher who who says, "All right, who broke the rule?" And no one confesses. So answer it. You're all staying in after class until whoever it is fesses up. That kind of feels a little bit like uh, the regions um, are kind of feeling like that. And they just want, hey, Melbourne, can you just please fess up so that we can go free? <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> hey, you've been the pastor for at Faith Church now for how many years? Uh, we came down from Adelaide in 2010. Yeah. So and then, about... we, then we did a, a three-year transition with Alan and yep. I think we took over... Yeah, 2013, I think, 2012, 2013. Yeah. So. Talk to us a little bit about, because I've heard, um, I've heard, I've actually heard your side of the story and I've also heard Alan's side of the story um, when he came up here, because he came and did our induction. It was so great. Oh, wow, um, that's good. And um, that was that was our second last service before all of this stuff. Um, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. Um, but um, he... Um, I heard it from him. So just explain a little bit about how that, that sort of transition period worked and how you ended up going from Adelaide to, to um, Melbourne and why would you or why wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually grew up in Melbourne and yeah. I actually, my parents got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Then they went to a Baptist church in Fentry yeah. Gully. 
and then uh, probably around the, the mid '80s when there was a big move of the spirit right across the world. Yeah, uh, we uh, the, the, we kind of split off from the Baptist Church and we got filled with the spirit. We're looking for a good Pentecostal church to get connected in, and we started to go to Faith, which was back then Danny Nong AOG. Okay, yeah. And so I was there, uh, just part of the youth group. And then it was around that time that I felt to go to Bible college. So I went to Harvest Bible College Yep. Uh, back then. And then it was around that time that my parents felt called to go to Adelaide. So we moved to Adelaide. So I was actually in faith. It was my first ACC church yep. back when I was uh, 18 years old. So many years ago. So I was actually surprised that I did this full circle and kind of come all the way back. What twenty years later? I'd say almost thirty years later. So it's it's been quite quite amazing. That that's that's incredible. I mean, I remember when I was in Bible college, I was attending a church called um, Campbelltown City Church in in Southwest Sydney. Um, so we drive down from Katoomba. I went to Commonwealth Bible College. Well, they changed the name to Southern Cross Bible College now, Alpha Crucis. And we drive down every week. We drive down from Katoomba down to Campbelltown, and we'd be in part, involved in the team there. And then, you know, I went off and got married, moved to Canberra, moved to Melbourne, moved back to Sydney, went to Hillsong for a while, and then Rachel's mum and dad came back and became the pastors of what was then Macarthur Christian Life Centre, which wow. used to be Campbelltown City Church. So we wow. went back there, and we actually were a part of that. And then it transitioned to Hillsong Southwest Campus. We were there for about a total of about fifteen, seventeen years. Uh, back in the church that I used to go to in um, in um, when I was in Bible college, it's pretty cr- it's pretty crazy. Isn't it amazing? Amazing how God yeah. works, though. It's fantastic. Wow. Um, so, when when did, were you at Harvest Bible College? When, what sort of year, years were that? Mid eighties, I reckon. I 80s. yeah, because I went to yeah. my Baptist pastor. He was a great guy, and I said I want to go into the ministry, and I felt stirred and called of God when I was about 17 or 16 sorry and he said he goes don't go to the Baptist seminary he goes they'll kill you spiritually (laughs) (laughs) that's his that was his (laughs) confession not mine Uh, I love my Baptist heritage Uh, but uh, so he said go to this thing called a harvest and I said what's harvest and he said it's a bible college it's it's run by the AOG you'll enjoy it and so I went there and that's how I got connected in yeah, so, actually, quite amazing. I've often heard it referred to that seminaries often referred to as um, cemeteries. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yes, cemeteries yeah. and bridal college. <laughs> yeah, bridal college too. Yes, um, I I got married straight out of Bible college. However, my wife Rachel was not at the same college, but we were connected. Um, we'd met a number of times at different functions and events through that. So, um, yeah, I went to I went to college single and basically came out married. Um, there you go. It's it works. It it does. It so, works. Hey, if you're listening to this works. and you're a single person, go to Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get to Bible college these days, <laughs> yes, that's right. It's all online, so it's like it must be. I wonder how that. Maybe they have some like sort of online fraternity, sort of you know, Christian mingle for um, people who are in Bible colleges. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you you were over in um, in in Adelaide, and um, and then. Yeah, you you were a part of the team over there at one of the churches. Is um, that you know, Influences Church? Yeah, so that was Influences Church. Um, I think Russell brought me on staff to look after the new Christians of the young adults. Yeah. And so I did that for a couple of years, and then when he left to uh, when he moved off from the from the young adults, Frank and I took over the young adults, and yep. we ran that for a couple of years. And then after that, we uh, helped Ashley and Jane build the church when Russell went off to to Melbourne. And so we did that for five years. And then just during that time, God started to speak to us. We felt stirred uh, to, you know, do our own thing. And so we just started to pray and fast. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they do that, they kind of, you know, put the word out there. But we didn't do that. We just wanted God to supernaturally open something. And so we went on a, I went on a 40-day fast and I had a dream yeah. three months in a row that I was working with a white-haired man. And I, I'd go, who is this white-haired man? And so... I'll be driving through the streets of Adelaide, looking around with all the white-haired men, you know, trying to see who who's that guy that oh, keeps yeah. appearing in my dream. And uh, uh, then uh, Pastor Alan was down at the state conference in Adelaide, 
Yeah. And someone asked me to pick him up and drive him around. And so I picked him up. And as he jumped in the car, I thought, oh, you're the white haired man in my dream. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, then we just had a conversation. I mean, it wasn't even about church or anything like that. And just kind of a relationship formed out of that. And we ended up in Melbourne. And it was funny, you know, because when I really felt it was time for us to go, you, you kind of yeah. know when it's time for that season to end and the new season yeah. to open up. I just thought the Lord said to me, I want you to resign. And I said, uh, there's nothing really to go to. But he said, you need to take a step of faith. And the word that he spoke to me was out of Abraham and Isaac. And he said, you know, Abraham never saw the provision until he got to the top of the mountain. He yeah. goes, you haven't even started the journey of faith yet. And you're hoping to see the provision. You've got to start walking that journey. You know, you preach about faith, start, start operating in faith. And so we went on that journey and uh, we resigned. And it was funny that when I met Alan that September at the state conference in Adelaide, uh, he said, oh, he said, I heard you resign. You, you resigned from your chair, you know, from your position. And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, oh, good. He said, well, let's have a conversation about my church, which was completely surprising. And he yeah. said, I've been praying about you for the last couple of years. We feel that you're the next guy, but obviously we haven't communicated that to you. And he said, but we were never going to have that conversation unless you were, you know, you were kind of free from your current responsibilities. Because he said, I always said to the Lord, I would never take another man's man. Yeah. So that was like a confirmation that God was all in it. So it's amazing how you think you're taking a step of faith, but God has got the the end result already under control. He just hasn't bothered to tell you yet. <laughs> but I guess that's faith, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, and that's right, and and you sort of I I think that's that's exactly right in, in, in stepping out in faith. It's fu it's funny because we we did something. It wasn't exactly the same. We felt God stirring us to to move, and you know a bit more of our our story. But um, we were in a position where we could still serve very faithfully while our pastor was aware that we were you know actually were were we're looking for something we're looking for yeah. that next step but able to still input and and able to to finish things there um you know in a, in a in a good way so we wanted to um to always do that now th that's interesting you talk about what alan said because I, I remember him telling me he said yeah he, you know god told me that this is the guy he says but you can't touch him uh <laughs> you can't touch him well and so like, okay so he just had to sit and wait and then wait, and then as soon as it came open, and you took that step, the door opened straight away. Mm. It's like it's amazing how God lines things up, and, and he, he often will put things in front of us, and then wait for us to respond um, and and act. And uh, I'm yeah, I love the. Uh, and, and it's funny when you see the big picture, like at the end of it, you know, I think there's a picture where you know Peter's fishing, and Jesus says, "Cast your net onto the other side," and then when he did that it kind of dawned on him that who Jesus was. So he gets at the boat, he runs, and he, there's this sense that he realised at the end of it, and we kind of do that, don't we? We just act in obedience. We're throwing that net on the other side. We're just doing what we feel the Lord has asked us to do. But it's only when you get to the end of it, you go, oh, yeah, God was in it. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. But uh, you never really know. I mean, the Bible does say, you know, we, we one day we'll see face to face, but right now we see dimly. I mean, that's faith, isn't it? You never really know you're always stepping out you, you you're testing you know what god is saying to you but yep. that's part of the whole journey is it if you knew the end result well then it wouldn't yep. be right yeah exactly that um it's quite funny because this is my third recording today i, I don't mind telling people I, i'm hey this is not live guys just so you know um and that scripture's come up in each of our three recordings so we've talked about that with a couple of different guys i just got off the you know we, last week we were talking to um pastor tim hall um, and we were talking about all the different mystery and stuff like that. All the, it just lines up, so I'm excited. That's about good. You. Hey, um, I wanted to um, to talk about your role as ACC president for Victoria, yep. and how that then and and what the ACC state does, and then how that relates to a church in the regional Victoria, three hours from Melbourne, and what it means for the people of that church. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, we are, the way that our movement has been set up, we probably wouldn't even say that we are a movement in the traditional sense, like a denomination. We are what they would call a fellowship of churches, yeah. which is really unusual, you know, because the government tries to get its head around what we actually are because we're not a denomination like the Anglican or the Baptist. We are a fellowship of churches. So independent churches with their own boards and their own constitutions 
And it is a fellowship at the end of the day. And I think part of the role of state executive is to make sure that that fellowship, they're engaging and we're talking to one another. And, you know, some of the churches that are struggling, they will feel the support of the state executive and the larger churches and that, that you know, we are really fostering the, the, the wheels behind the scenes to keep this fellowship healthy and strong and unified. And, you know, we're all going in the same direction. Uh, a lot of our practical role in the state executive is really to help churches that are struggling. And uh, I mean, we, you know, we, you often don't hear about it, but there's a number of churches probably on a regular basis that are either struggling with personnel or struggling with a certain area of ministry that they need breakthrough in. And this is where the, the state behind the scenes, the state team are working very hard just to help churches and help them function well. Uh, you know, right through this lockdown, obviously there's been a lot of conversation about what can we do what can we do, can't do in our last year? We did a representation to the government uh, along with some other key churches to make sure that we weren't left behind when the state was slowly opening up again. And this was at the end of last year. And, uh, you know, there certainly wasn't a narrative at the beginning of lockdown where the churches, where people were mindful of the churches. Near the end, they were mindful, the government was. And when they'd mentioned the cafes and the businesses, that also meant, meant, mentioned the churches as well. And I, I definitely think that uh, we had something to do with that. Uh, no doubt, not only us, but a number of other churches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so just things like that in order to make life easier for a senior minister, you know, if we can take some of the burden uh, off his shoulders in terms of global things or statewide things like that, then I think we're doing our job really well. Yeah, and and I, as a, as a senior minister, I thoroughly appreciate um, all of the efforts. Um, I, I'm on the phone to uh, Mark Bates or Ian yeah. Krutov you know, every week. Those guys are the best. <laughs> and I, we just we just chat and, and connect, and, and I ask I ask them all sorts of questions about different things because the pastoring now people look at it. So our, our our one of our first pastors here at Harvest was Pastor John Martin, great man of God, great man of faith. Um, he was kind of pastoring the same era that my dad was, but pastoring now is completely different. You're, uh, there's, there's so much policy and governance and, um, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's huge. It, it's absolutely yeah. huge. You, you know, you're right. You need to be an evangelist. You need to be a pastor. You need to have a level of counselling. You need to know governance behind the scenes, how to run boards. It's, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah, and we're learning to do that. So we appreciate all of the help that we get from from state um, and those guys. And you know, particularly when we, we call about whatever, so oh hey, what about this kind of course for somebody who's who's wanting to um, get their credential? Yeah, that's great. Do that. Oh, okay, fantastic. So lots of guidance and counsel and wisdom. We love it. And, and, and if we can actually connect, I mean, you know, you mentioned you came and checked at our church about what we do. You know, if we can connect churches together. Yeah. In a in a healthy relationship in a way that can that can actually help each other, yeah. um, then I, we're it's really what we should be doing because we are a fellowship. You know, we, yeah. we're not just a legal denomination. We are a fellowship of churches that when we come together, we're stronger together. Yeah. So the things that ACC like. Um, Policies and procedures aren't necessarily like mandates. Every church is autonomous and responsible for their own board and decisions, uh, et cetera. Cool. But there's a framework there that can be applied to pretty much every church that we can take advantage of, uh, particularly when it comes to things like child protection policy and all of that kind of business. Yeah, yeah. and you got to understand, I mean, you know, we have got intellectual property that has been shaped and honed We've had lawyers look at it over many, many, many years. So you've got a huge resource there where yeah. you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, if you can, we can empower you just to pastor and pastor well and preach well and minister, yeah. but you can tap into these other resources where, you know, we do have a back office team that, that put these things together. Well, it's just yeah. going to help you do your job better and it's going to make you compliant as well with what the government requires, which is incredibly important. <laughs> It is incredibly important and it's incredibly huge now compared to what it used to be, um, this, the level of government compliance that we have to go through, working with children checks, all that kind of business, um, and you know, making sure that all of our ACNC um, reports are in and, and done. There's, there's a lot, isn't there? So it can, even just talking about it, I'm starting to feel a little bit like, whew, okay, <laughs> we'll be all right. You've overwhelmed yourself. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm okay. It's all good. Um, but I'm actually relishing it. I, I love it. We we came to Victoria and we didn't know uh, 
anybody apart from Shannon Riley over in Bansdale was the only real person that we knew. I think I met um, – I got off a plane on my on my one of my trips down here and, and I caught the bus from the train into the city um, and had a coffee with Ian Krutoff and then I caught the train up here to, to – um, to Horsham, oh wow, um, or Ararat, and and then uh, that was I think my second week here. <clears throat> so that was just starting to get to know people. Excuse me, I just need a little bit of water. <laughs> but it's been it's been incredible how people have embraced us and and gotten to know us. And I mean, there's there's a, a whole bunch of people on the team that that don't not just in a senior role, but even some of the the younger guys like. Dave Edgar is an absolute gun at um, at connecting people. Dave Edgar is Dave Edgar's just is <laughs> is a, a great connector. He knows how to. He just knows everyone, and so you know, I think he's even helped some of the country churches get some youth pastors. Yeah, uh, and again in in the fellowship framework, making these connections. Yeah. Uh, because there is resource out there. You know, there are people out there that want to have a crack and do something for God and just getting, and often you, you're like me, we just head down, run in our church. We often yeah. don't look outside of our church. So I think that, that that's a great thing as well. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask? I was going to ask about churches. There's there's a number of different church models sort of um, floating around. You've got your, um, your campus model where a, a, a central campus will, will plant you know, micro campuses or, or, or smaller locations in different parts of the city or even around the uh, around the state, even overseas. I mean, uh, um, I think there's a, there's a few churches that are doing that. There's You've got your autonomous, independent church. You've got like a home church kind of set up. Um, why do you think it's important that we – or or do you think it's important that we have one fixed model or – or, or is a range of those options appropriate? No, I think it's a range of options. I, I, I think, you know, in a movement, churches do different things according to the vision of the senior minister, according to what the, the senior minister is grace to do. So I think there's yeah. a couple of things. Number one, there's not one model that's going to meet, you know, reach everyone. So yeah. uh, I think the beauty about it is, you know, we have a small sport of different churches, the way they do ministry, their emphasis, what they actually go after. And they're going to reach certain parts of the community that I myself or you probably wouldn't be able to reach because of just who they are and their style. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is obviously the mandate of the minister. And uh, I'm always a firm believer, stick to your lane, stick to the mandate yeah. that God has given you. You know, learn from everyone else and, you know, learn from uh, mistakes and learn from successes, but don't try to emulate someone else. Yeah. Just, you know, be, be you who you are. And, uh, you know, I have a very narrow scope. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm terrible at. And uh, so I just stick to what I'm good at. Like, for example, us, you know, we don't really want to plant 20, 30, 40 campuses. We have four campuses. We want to get them in their own facilities. We want them to be full service churches. We want them to be strong and healthy. Um, you know, the whole southeast of Melbourne, we, you know, we're building something at the moment, a 750 seater auditorium in the southeast. That's one of our campuses. And I say that because we just, what I feel to be obedient to the Lord is do those four, do them well. And maybe God will open up something else later on. Uh, but that's really not my vision. My vision is to have these four and actually do them well. So, but that's my lane and I'm very comfortable with my lane. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and for me, that's within my scope. And I feel God is blessing us where we are at the moment. So I would say to every senior minister, you know, stick to what you know, stick to what you're good at. Yeah. And, uh, you know, strengthen your strengths and I think you'll find you'll get a long way. Yeah, that's that's right. I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot from the perspective of, um, you know, the church is starting to get used to this use of technology. Like most people know we've got a... Uh, a, a campus, a location in the in the town of Nil, which is about an hour north of um, of awesome. Horsham, um, and you know, we might get thirty, sometimes forty people attend that location. You know, it's not a very big community. Um, you know, overall, with you know, there's probably around about two thousand people in the whole town. But for that church there to be a standalone church, I mean, you got to have a board, um, mm. someone to do the finances. You got to have a a pastor. You it makes it very difficult for a church to have all that it needs by itself when it's that size. That's yeah. right. And, and also, I think there are some, like, there's a number of ministers out there that don't want to do all that. 
see, I don't mind doing all that. I, I, I quite, in, not that I enjoy it, but I would see it's part of what I do. Yeah. There are some guys, I mean, I've got some campus guys who could quite easily pass to their own thing, but they don't want to be bothered about the boards and all the structure and all the governance behind the scenes. They just want to preach and pastor. So I do think there's a group of people that just want to do that really well. So I think those two together in harmony can actually build quite a powerful campus model. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's right. It's It's got to be the horses for courses. And and if you're graced to do it, do it. If you're not graced to do it, don't do not do it. When you're stepping out of your out of your lane, that leads to it just leads to burnout and trouble. Yeah, you, absolutely. Uh, yep, yeah, we we know. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was just to give people a bit of an insight into your family. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how many kids you have, or, or what's your family, what's home life like, and I mean, particularly now at the moment, everyone's sort of working from home. Yep. So I've got, uh, I've been married for 27 years. Wow. Yeah, 27 years. And uh, we've got a 24-year-old daughter. We've got a 21-year-old son turning 22 this year. And then we've got a 17-year-old turning 18. So we've got five adults in the house. Yeah. And uh, first lockdown, <laughs> it was like, it oh, was dear. so intense. But I think we've learned, we, we've adjusted. And so... <clears throat> Second lockdown two point was it? What are we at now? Five point oh, six point oh. I think you guys are still in six. There's some talk whether or not we're regionals in seven or six point five. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be like a a, a constitution six point one a four four. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, but um, I think one of the keys to to healthy family life in um, in lockdown is good noise cancelling headphones um, can be a bit of a lifesaver for people. So just, just take it. It's an investment in your in your future. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. yeah no, look, we, we've got, I mean, you know, we have, I mean, regardless of what then or not, we, there are certain things that we do religiously. One of them, we have dinner together. Yeah. Uh, no matter how busy we are, that's just the, the dinner table is sacred. Uh, yeah, so great. We come together and talk about the day and give us updates and, you know, we, we've many discussions at the dinner table, sometimes arguments, sometimes di- difference in conflict or, um, you know, opinion, but it's all there to connect. And so yep. uh, uh, so that's really important for us. And then we all like our own spaces as well. So, you know, the ebbs and flows of life of, of a family, I, yep. I, I think they're really healthy. And yep. uh, But I would say we've grown closer as a family. I, I definitely think that we are a lot more appreciative of each other. Yeah. Uh, which I think is really good. We get so busy in ministry uh, that we're off doing our own thing and, you know, maybe talk maybe three times a week, but, uh, you know, outside of the dinner table. But now there's been a few more good, healthy discussions. So I think it's been good. It's been good for us. Yeah, no, and it is, it is really important. You can And being in ministry, you can easily lose sight of some of those important things. Now, not going to bag on my dad because he was a great dad. I love him. But, you know, he, he did have a very, very busy ministry life and he mm. was off and away, um, sometimes, you know, good six, eight weeks at a time. And, um, you know, and he was very thoughtful. He always brought something back and or he, he um, would touch base with us from time to time and, and that. But there was a, a, a real big push and maybe that was just generational or, or something within that, that era. Um, but you kind of felt a little, you know, relatively disconnected. I, I kind of feel like there's been a lot more focus on pastors actually, you know, making sure that it, there's, there's a priority on family um, in ministry. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, if, you, if your home life is not healthy, I think in anything, whether it's ministry or whatever you do, if your home life is yeah. not healthy, it just makes life so much harder. Yeah. You know? So... Uh, and if you want a healthy home life, you just you you got it. It just doesn't happen on its own. You got to be intentional about it. You you, you know you got to pour yourself into your family. I mean, all these things that I'm saying are obvious, but it's just so important. But you can forget that if you're busy doing stuff, serving the church, whatever it may be. Uh, but you you know if you want a healthy life, then yeah, I always say healthy, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I found that that works. You know, it's, a, it's just a simple, simple formula, but 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 it works. So yeah, it's good. So good. And I, I noticed just from watching some of your your Instagram um, stories that you you do enjoy the occasional um, 
grilling of meats. It says in the word you got you got to move away from the milk and step into the meat uh, of the word, Amen. but also the meat of actual beef and chicken and pork and lamb is important as well. So, what what's your favorite thing to do on the on the grill? Yeah, so we we kind of I think it's been one of the good things about lockdown is that we've taken our because we take a lot of our staff on this journey as well. So when we first started, we we're doing pizzas. Now we've moved to meat and yeah. have some cooking goals because you know you can cook at home. You don't need to go out. You can actually uh, in the privacy of your own home you can develop your culinary skills. And so we've been on this meat journey. So smoking brisket oh, yeah. has been has been one of the big uh, the big challenges. And then doing things like tomahawks and oh. you know these really nice big cuts of meat. Salivating. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's been good. I did a brisket the other day. Did a twelve-hour brisket. Came out beautiful. Wow. And uh, tomahawks. So there's a thing called reverse searing. I mean, it doesn't matter which way you do it. Yeah. Where you uh, you, you slow cook it first, and then yeah. you sear it right at the end, really hot. And so you know we've been experimenting on different things. I've been injecting tomahawks with. Uh, Certain, certain flavors and trying different, you know, just normal salt and pepper, but then other things. So it's been awesome. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually good to experiment. I've, I've got a smoker myself. I've got the um, big green egg and I love it. <laughs> um, I, I still, I, I've only tackled the brisket maybe once or twice and I've, I've got to get back into it. Um, but I, I'm really f- struggling with my temperature control and getting it up to temperature when you want to sear. Like if I've been on a slow cook for a while and I want to sear, I, I'm finding it really struggling to get the the temperature up there. This is no, of no relevance to anybody at home, uh, but <laughs> if you got some, if you got some tips for us, uh, <laughs> I, I, I would appreciate those. But I'll, I'm I'm thinking now I've got to go and get a you know a tomahawk and get it on there. Do the reverse sear. Oh, you reckon about two hours on slow cook? Um, I, two I or reckon three. an hour on, on a tomahawk. I, I don't think you need any more. Maybe I mean I'm mine are like half an hour, forty minutes. Uh, yeah, so, absolutely. So, it wouldn't be any more than that. And then yeah. two minutes either side, just to get the nice crisscross, really hot. And then then you don't need, then you just let it rest. But I get my meat to room temperature before I cook it, so don't cook oh, it. That's important. Cold. Yeah, yeah. Just get it to room temperature, so it's nice and soft, and you know, salt and pepper it. That's all that you need. And yeah. then and then off you go. Rachel doesn't believe in that. She believes that meat should be in the fridge until it goes on the grill. Oh. Um, and I'm like, no, 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 you gotta, it's got to get to room temperature. She said, yeah, but it's going to go off. And go, no, it doesn't go off that quickly. What are they? They never used no, to meat, have meat. Meat doesn't. Uh, uh, beef doesn't. <laughs> no, no, I mean, other I wouldn't do it with chicken. chicken. I wouldn't do it with no. chicken. Beef, not a problem. Yeah. So it, it's just one of those learning curves. But uh, it's, it's fun that you, you've got to have an outlet. As, as a as a pastor, as and in not just even as a pastor, but as a as a person, you've got to have something sort of outside of what you do normally that is um, a, not just a distraction, but maybe like a hobby or something that actually is replenishing to you um, and and builds builds you back up. Um, do you have anything else that you enjoy um, being involved in, like golf or anything like that? No, it's at the moment it's just really cooking. I mean, yeah. before then I was pretty heavily involved at the gym. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm still doing some body weight exercises and things like that, but mainly it's been the cooking. I mean, you know, mastering meat, that's, that's a, that's a journey mastering good pizza. That's another journey. Yeah. So, uh, they, these are kind of the two that I've just wanted to shape and develop and kind of get ready. And I cooked a whole bunch of pieces for our people that are involved in community service. So they run, uh, you know, every Thursday we run a community service where we feed hundreds of people. So yep. all the volunteers, I cooked them pizza the other day. I loved it. But that was good just to see how many I could punch out. <laughs> Mate, I, I'm, I'm already hungry. I'm on my way to your house after this. Well, there actually, you go. Come on. It's, out, it's outside the five-kilometre radius, and it's not an approved reason to leave my house right now. But <laughs> but even get an I, exemption. They get an exemption. Uh, we, could we organise? Can, can, I don't know. I don't know. I'm thinking. I'm thinking too far. Anyway, sorry, sorry, um, Daniel Andrews. I won't be thinking about getting an exemption to go and have meat, <laughs> but we will do it sometime soon. As soon as we're allowed, um, we'll be down there. Um, I had one other question I wanted to talk to you about. Is um, and we'll probably sort of wrap up on this topic. Is about what um, what kind of things are you seeing um, for the church today? 
um, in today's society that are really, really important for us to be focused on as believers? Uh, Topics and all that? Yeah, well, no, I'm I'm even thinking about what's happening in culture and society. Um, You've had a lot of interaction with even government. There's decisions that are being made. There's, there's, look, for me, I see there's a whole bunch of fear and fear mongering um, around that's causing people to to be afraid. So I think it's important that we actually preach on peace uh, and we actually, you know, we, we give people, you know, practical things that they can do to to combat that. But also we've got to preach the word of God um, and, and not not just sort of, oh, here's five practical tips to that. I'm thinking about what are some of the things that from your position as being like a state leader, you're also on the national executive, what are some of the things that churches and, and Christians need to be aware of in the coming years that you, you, you're you already thinking through? I, I just think we have to be careful that we never lose our mandate, and that is to preach the good news. Yeah. So, you know, we, I mean, we can talk about good psychology and we can talk about good tips for living and all those, and all, nothing wrong with all that, but the platform is the good news. Yeah. And um, I think we just got to be careful. I think, number one, there's a big need in this season for people to hear good news. Yeah. And uh, when I talk about good news, about what Christ can do for them personally, you know, and uh, what it means to be a believer and what it, what does it mean to actually surrender your life. I mean, you think about it, Christianity is the only thing on the face of the earth that basically says, well, if you lose your life, you'll gain it. You know, everyone yeah. else says, you know, you, you need you need it, you know, get as much as you can. But you know, the word of God has a complete reverse idea that says, you know, if you really, you know, surrender in the world is a sign of defeat. Surrender in our faith uh, just it is a sign of breakthrough. You know, when yeah. you surrender, that's when you allow God to come through. So we have a different message. It's not the same message as everyone else. Think about the principles that the word of God has been built upon completely to the opposite to the way that the world would see success in that is good news and if people can understand what god can actually do in their life in this season you're right there is a lot of fear there is a lot of uncertainty right there there, there are a lot of people that are freaking out um jesus deals with all of those things absolutely all of those things and i just think we have to be careful that we um don't use our platform for other agendas you know yeah and uh, we have all these different opinions about COVID, about vaccines, about this, about that. And uh, what God personally spoke to me about is that the platform that I've been given, that I've given you, is not a platform of your opinion. It's the platform of the Word of God. And if you were to start a church of your opinion, no one would come to your church. That's and right. We've got to be real careful as ministers that we don't shift, and all of a sudden it becomes a platform we're using about our opinion about certain political things. That's not our mandate. Our mandate is to preach the gospel, to let people know about how good God is and the power that Jesus can actually have in their life. And again, my lane is very narrow, but I find when I stick to my lane, I see the blessing of God. And so I just think we, you know, we just can't get muddied in our message of overlaying it with 20 other messages. Let's just stick to our lane. Let's preach the gospel. Let's yeah. preach Christ well. And uh, I mean, honestly, in this season, the amount of people, even our young people, they get a lot of DMs from young kids who are freaking out, who have got fear in their life. Uh, that they, they don't really care about the. They don't really care about the world events. They care about how it's affecting them. What a great yeah. way to lead people to Christ in this season. Yeah, so good, so good. I love that. We, we've got to may, remain focused on the main thing. Yeah, the main thing and what our mandate. What's our mandate? Yeah. You know, our mandate is is, you know, when I was called to the ministry, I was called to the ministry to preach the gospel. I'll continue to do that. Yeah. So and uh, you know, I don't I don't know whether people respect a leader that's always um uh is always distracted by other things, you know. Um I think they're looking for a stable ship to lead them through this season. So yeah. Yeah, and that's got to be based on the Word of God and um, absolutely and the gospel. So absolutely. that's fantastic. Thank you for that, Pastor Matt. That was that's actually a really good perspective, and it's a good thing for for everybody who's watching to to understand that you don't um, have to wait. F- you don't have to. Um, sorry, you don't have to be a pastor to have that mandate. 
No. You, you, you can, you can be, you, you've, you're called yourself to actually be a follower of Christ and to go and make disciples yourself. That's the, and, and to preach the good news. You know, that's, right. um, that's it's not just up to us. So being a Christian is more than just coming to church on a Sunday. Um, you know, what's the old adage that says, you know, it, you know, coming to church on a Sunday doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to the garage doesn't make you a car. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, so, and, and I think, and I think this generation, I think these days, people want to know whether what you believe actually works. Yeah. So, you know, they want to see whether what you believe is actually has the power to sustain you through the storms and the difficulties and the pressures that you're under. Yeah. So, what a great way! Trust me, if it didn't work, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> that's you know. that's right. Um, I, just on just on that one point there that. I, th- I think there's a perspective of, of people that they they want to see that what you're doing works now, hmm. instantly. So we've kind of created this sort of instant coffee culture of Christianity where, you know, hey, if you do this, boom, bang. No, hang on, no, it's not quite like that. <laughs> there's there's a journey to to um, to, to yeah. go on and, and be on. Yeah, and when I say that, I don't mean is you know that no. like Father Christmas and whatever we ask for, bang. We, but this this discipline, this this commitment of the the Christian life, what it actually produces in you, yeah. and it produces stability. It produces peace. It produces a clear head. It produces yeah. an ability to weather the storm. You know, so I mean, we've had a we've had a, a number of health issues in our church over COVID and I think what a horrible season to find out that you're sick with something when it's very hard for your family to come around you. But when I talk to some of these people that have been in our church for many years, there's a strength and a stability. There's a, there's a confidence that God will lead them through this. And if you've never met God, you, you, you never really understand what that is like. And, uh, you know, it's working for these guys, their years of serving God, it's, it's coming back. They're reaping it in this sense of confidence as they journey some of these uh, difficult seasons. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Look, thanks so much for being with us today, um, Pastor Matt. Oh, one thing that we do ask everybody who comes on the program, let's call it that, whatever, podcast, vodcast, I don't know. Uh, my daughter's told me I made up a word when I said vodcast. And I'm going, doesn't that just mean video podcast? Goes, no, that's not the same thing okay (laughs) whatever cultures changed i I get in trouble from my kids if i text them and i put a full stop at the end of the sentence yeah like apparently that's rude uh, and you don't if you don't do like a thumbs up or a smiley face or something like that they'll ask you what's wrong yeah Yeah, wrong. (laughs) (laughs) things have changed but hey one thing that we do ask every pastor who comes on is just to pray for um harvest church pray for rachel and i's leaders and um, that we would see God's um, spirit poured out here. Mm, I'd love to do that. I'd yeah, love to awesome. do that. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for our time together. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you for Harvest Church. I thank you, God, for the wonderful heritage. And Holy Spirit, I also thank you for the amazing future that you've got for the church. God, I just pray right now that you just put your hand upon Andrew, Andrew and Rachel, God, as they... God, move the church forward into this new season. I pray, Holy Spirit, God, that you would just give them wisdom and strength. And thank thank you, Lord God, that you've called them for such a time as this, in this season, for this season, just to lead this church through this season of challenge. And Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you'd open doors that no man shuts. God, I pray that you'd shut doors that no man opens. God, that you would lead them. And Holy Spirit, I just pray for breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. God, even some of the things that they're believing for yes, God. As, a, as a church, God, we just prophesy breakthrough in those areas. Yes, God, Jesus. we prophesy open doors in those areas, I pray. God, bless them, refresh them, strengthen them, I pray, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Matt, for that. Hey, if you don't already follow Pastor Matt on Instagram, well, not that way, that way, um, it's right above his um, name there. Okay, <laughs> I can't know where to point. I've got to go the opposite way. Here we go. <laughs> it's right there. Give him a follow at Matt Hines on Instagram. Uh, check him out. And um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much to Faith Church uh, for allowing you to, the time to be able to, to record with us and um, be blessed. Love you guys. Ciao.